Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Fantasy Flight Games in Flight Report. Uh, I'm Chris Gerber, head of Fantasy Flight Games Studio. Uh, as you know, last year we were unable to deliver our in flight report in person due to the coronavirus. And this year, we once again are going to be staying safe in our studio here in Minnesota. And so, even though I can't see all of your faces, uh, I can't wait to show off some of the great things we have in store for you today and give you all a sneak peek into some of the awesome games we've been working on. Uh, here at FFG, we always strive to innovate and push our games to the next level, whether that's through art, mechanics, or player experience. And so tonight I have some updates uh, to some of our biggest product lines, including some new things that uh, I'm going to tease for the first time tonight. Uh, and as a quick aside, uh, please keep in mind that due to the ongoing unpredictability of the global shipping situation right now, I'm not going to be able to give you any precise release dates for anything that I talk about uh, today. But uh, I do, um, I want you to all to be, to rest assured that we're going to be doing everything we can to get these cool new products into your hands as soon as possible. And uh, I just want to say thanks for your understanding and your patience on that. So, on behalf of everybody at the studio, I'd like to express our deepest thanks to all of you for joining us here and sharing in our love, our communal love for uh, tabletop gaming. So, without further ado, let's kick off today's presentation with some updates on one of our biggest games ever, Descent Legends of the Dark. I mean, this beast of a game <laughs> is one of FFG's crowning achievements. It's a massive project that took over three years in the making. And when I say massive, I, I really mean it. This was one of the, this was the largest single project that we as a studio have ever worked on. And it involved more people's work across, I mean, basically every single FFG uh, department that we have to get here uh, than anything we've ever done in the past. I think, personally, we created something really unique and special with this product. Uh, I'm very proud of it, and we are thrilled to see the response that people have had uh, after the game finally released uh, just this early August. So all last month, I have been hearing reports of people diving into the game and finding fun and unique ways to move through the story from uh, role-playing in their characters' voices uh, to everybody on the edge of their seats as they, they watch the darkness phase unfold, uh, wondering what's going to happen next. And I cannot express how happy I am to see such a strong start for Descent. And, and fortunately, this legend is only just getting started. Um, so, Legends of the Dark is the first game to take place in the newly rebranded Terranoth Legends universe. Uh, longtime fans of Terranoth and Descent, uh, the franchise are going to find many things that are familiar about this latest take on FFG's classic fantasy setting, but also a lot of differences as we move forward. I mean, starting with this engrossing narrative in the first act of Legends of the Dark, where player decisions lead to real stakes in the world of Terranoth. Uh, we've been just really working hard to push this IP into something fresh and exciting uh, that'll sustain for years to come um, and entertain for years to come. So if you've been, uh, if you're still hesitant to jump onto the Descent hype train, I really do encourage you to give this new foray into Terranoth a try. Now, before I give a sneak peek on some of the upcoming content for Descent, and I, I do want to share just a little bit on that, um, I would like to share a look at some cool Descent goodies that uh, you may be aware of. Uh, first up are these um, fantastic, these fantastic dice, frankly, from Level Up Dice. Uh, these high quality dice are made from semi-precious stones and add some real weight to your game. I mean, these things are, are they have some real heft to them. <laughs> And uh, we, re we revealed these awesome accessories uh, a little while ago, and now we're finally getting them in hand. And I just, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Level Up because these things, uh, frankly, are awesome. Um, you can find more info about them uh, on their website, uh, maybe down here, I don't know. 
<laughs> um, and if you're worried about damaging these new dice, if you do pick these up, uh, just don't forget that they can be played um, on this really cool Descent game map that we have uh, from our friends at our partners at GameGenic. Um, really cool. So, and finally, if you want to take your game to the total next level and go even deeper into the stories that surround Legends of the Dark and the, the Terranoth universe, um, you can dive into the latest novel by Aconite Books, The Gates of Thelgrim. Uh, so if that's uh, something you want to do, go check it out at a uh, FFG or Aconite's websites for more information on all of the Descent novel products you can find there. So anyway, back to the main game. I bet you are all wondering what is next for the story of Descent and our six intrepid heroes. And I'm not going to give any spoilers uh, for the Act 1. Uh, but this game launched with the entirety of that Act 1 campaign ready to go. And I am pleased to confirm that Act 2 is already well on its way uh, through development here at FFG. And that said, though, every journey has many twists and turns, and sometimes uh, we wind up on a sidetrack. So I want to show you this. So this, uh, we're very proud of our plastic in this game, and this guy is a tricky new foe uh, that you might find yourself facing off against in Ghosts of Greyhaven, which is a brand new side story for Descent. Uh, whose contents can be incorporated into the main Blood and Flame campaign. Um, I can't share too many details just yet with this expansion. I just wanted to show you this one uh, piece of plastic, which is, of course, a prototype. It's not going to be this color in the final box. Uh, but I can tell you that Ghosts of Greyhaven is going to come packed with uh, content that enhances the Descent experience for both the core set and all the future expansions to come. And so... While I am showing off this new plastic, though, uh, I wanted to give you a real early tease of what is in store for Act 2. I brought this uh, with me right here. This not-so-little thing. <laughs> uh, and just to show you how much we're upping the ante on this one, here is the bandit piece of plastic from Act 1. Uh, obviously... Uh, I'm not ready to show off this right now, but just seeing how big it is should give you a pretty good sense of scale and, a, and an idea of, of what we're going for in Act 2 that what's going to bring to the table. So The Legend of the Dark is only going to get more epic from here, so stay tuned. So I'm going to put these guys back. And I, I want to move on and take a look now at uh, some updates for a game that we haven't been able to talk about for a while, Keyforge. So just last week, we published an update on our website going over the current status of Keyforge and why we haven't been able to provide any new content for so long. And I'm not going to repeat everything here today, uh, but the key points of that message were that first, Keyforge is uh, going on hiatus for a bit. Um, and second, that we do very much hope and intend to launch a digital version of Keyforge courtesy of our friends at Stainless Games when we, when we bring it back. And in that same message, we, did, we also mentioned a bit of what's in store for the game when we return, uh, a, a new set called Winds of Exchange. And obviously, we have a lot, we'll have a lot more to share as we approach that relaunch, but I wanted to you know, give you all a little taste. I'm happy to share uh, a few additional details of what that set's all about. Among other things, the set introduces the game's 11th house, the Compacts of Equidon, uh, a member of which can be seen on the cover here. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this is a faction of merchants that are all about trade and exchange, and they do change up the way the game is played in, in all sorts of unique ways. And in addition to that new faction, the set does see the long-awaited return of House Mars. Uh, I'm sure that all of you longtime fans of Keyforge will be overjoyed to see the Martians' ridiculous antics return uh, in all their glory when the game relaunches. So that's Keyforge. Uh, stay tuned uh, for more information. Uh, all right. Now let's talk about a couple of our upcoming new games, A Game of Thrones Betwixt and Unfathomable. 
So just two weeks ago, we announced a Game of Thrones Betwixt, which is a brand new game set in George R.R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire universe. And in case you missed that announcement, Betwixt is a game, uh, as you'd expect, of political finesse and calculated betrayal, which of course makes it a perfect fit for the Game of Thrones setting. And the word betwixt means uh, between two people or things. Um, and that's not only thematically fitting for this game, it's also a part of the core mechanics. All of your power is shared with one neighbor or the other, and figuring out the best way to manipulate the other players uh, is key to coming out on top. In this fun little self-contained card game, you'll take on the role of iconic characters uh, such as Eddard Stark, Tyrion Lannister, Daenerys Targaryen, Melisandre, uh, Jon Snow, as you scheme and backstab your way into having the most powerful small council in Westeros. Uh, we're planning to release this game in late fall this year, so stay tuned for more upcoming news and previews in the coming weeks. And uh, before we do get into some more new stuff, uh, as I said, I'd like to also give a quick update on one of our most anticipated titles this year, Unfathomable. So back in June, we announced Unfathomable, a, a new game of traitors and terror taking place in the Arkham Horror Files universe, one of my absolute favorite uh, IPs. And we are super excited for this game, and I frankly like uh, can't wait to get it in my own hands. And we really hope, though, to get it into all of your hands uh, by the end of September. Unfortunately, it looks like that is not going to be the case. Some deep ones uh, have interfered with the shipping schedule. Apparently, they didn't appreciate us making a game about fighting them off. Uh, but, you know, honestly, uh, just in all seriousness, just like every other company in the world right now, we are facing some shipping and logistics delays. And I'd love to tell you that we are somehow magically immune to this problem, but sadly, we are not. And uh, you, of course, have, our, have my sincerest apologies for that. Uh, we will keep you all posted on when the, uh, you know, when we fight the deep ones off and, and, and are able to release Unfathomable, uh, but it is delayed a little bit. But we still hope to have it in everybody's hands before the end of this year. Um, so, okay, continuing on. Let's take a look at Spreading War, the next expansion for Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle-Earth. As many of you may already be aware, Spreading War is the latest uh, big box expansion for Journeys in Middle-Earth. It's also the last big box expansion for the game. When we first set out to develop this game, uh, the plan from the very beginning was to tell a concise story. We wanted to create a trilogy of campaigns, uh, and with the core set, Shadowed Paths, and now Spreading War, we succeeded. That being said, we do plan to follow the same release model that we used for the core game and Shadowed Pads, and this means that we're going to follow up Spreading War with a full digital DLC campaign and a supporting figure pack. And while I'm not quite ready to show off this additional content yet, keep an eye on our website and our social media accounts going forward to stay up to date on the latest news for that game. Uh, also, if you haven't done so yet, I, I, I would love to, you, you should uh, be sure to check out our unboxing and QA video on Spreading War that we streamed on August 11th. Uh, in that video, we take a really uh, great look at the expansion's contents, and our wonderful Grace Holdinghouse uh, brings some fantastic and, frankly, infectious energy to the table. Uh, okay, so we've talked about board games for a while now. Let's switch gears uh, a bit and uh, take a look at some upcoming products for our cooperative uh, LCGs. First off, we have Arkham Horror the Card Game. Can you believe that it's been almost five years since we launched this game? Uh, the Arkham LCG is one of FFG's biggest triumphs, and it's, it's not slowing down anytime soon. So to that end, we have a new announcement for the game, a brand new standalone scenario in the same vein as we've done for Gen Cons in the past, in years past. And this year's special scenario is called Machinations Through Time. And like its name suggests, it's a time-hopping adventure that shows us our first glance at the city of Arkham in other time periods. 
This scenario is going to involve investigators jumping between the 1890s, of course the 1920s, and then the 1950s, which is really cool. And the actions that they take in each era are going to affect what happens in the others as they work to solve a mystery surrounding scientists disappearing through time. And like the blob that ate everything and War of the Outer Gods, Machinations Through Time is, is, is compatible with uh, epic multiplayer mode. So while you can always enjoy the scenario with a normal uh, group of one to four players, you can also work together with other teams and solve this chronological caper when, when, it retur when, it, uh, when Machinations Through Time comes out in the first quarter of 2022. And before we get uh, to our next Arkham announcement, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the two upcoming Edge of the Earth expansions, which we announced uh, back in June. To recap on that, the next cycle for uh, Arkham LCG is going to be two robust expansions. The Investigator expansion, which is filled with new player cards, uh, it, all of the new player cards, and then the campaign expansion, which is uh, all the other cards, every card needed to play through an entirely new story. And these are both slated to come out later this fall. Uh, I wanted to just give a little insight. I decided that this new release model is the right direction to go for all future Arkham Horror Cycles for a couple reasons. Uh, first, this method allows us to have uh, the entirety of a campaign in one box, which means players aren't going to need to worry about potentially missing out on any parts of the story. This makes it a, a much more player-friendly, forward-thinking format that's a lot more sustainable going forward. And second, designing campaigns with this style in mind uh, really offers MJ and the uh, amazing uh, rest of our Arkham team to... Uh, have more freedom in the structure of the campaigns themselves uh, without having to worry about cramming the campaign into exactly six mythos packs that follow a linear plot structure. Now we can have campaigns like Edge of the Earth that have branching paths or, or, or multiple possible endings. And from what we've seen online, it seems like most of you agree that this is the, the way to go, which means that you'll be excited to learn that we are not just doing this for the new Arkham content, we're also doing it for the old stuff. So, obviously, some of you have probably already guessed that this was the plan, but today I'd like to officially uh, announce the first of these repackages, the Dunwich Legacy Investigator and Campaign Expansions. These two expansions take all the content that was previously released in the Dunwich Legacy cycle and combines them together into just those two boxes. So, just like Edge of the Earth, all the player cards for the cycle can be found in the Investigator expansion, while all the campaign cards and encounter cards can be then found in the campaign expansion. And I'd like to stress that this is, of course, all re-release content. So if you already own everything in the Dunwich Legacy cycle, you're not going to find anything new in either of those boxes. However, uh, if you are a new player just starting to get into Arkham, then this kind of repackage is going to be a fantastic and easy way to experience the LCG's first wave of expansions for yourself. So we're aiming to have both of those expansions in people's hands in the first quarter of next year with the investigator expansion coming first and then the campaign expansion coming about you know a month or two later. So stay tuned for more information on both of these titles in uh, the near future. All right so now uh, speaking of the LCG model and cooperative, this is probably something that, 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 is, uh, that you don't know. On our very own Lord of the Rings LCG has now been out for over 10 years. 10 years. And while a dedicated following has built up over the last decade, uh, we also have now, because of the, the 10 years, a whole slew of players that barely even know uh, about this incredible game. And uh, it's also very daunting to get in. Uh, so we've decided that we'd like to fix that. And so today, I am happy to announce the Lord of the Rings, the card game revised course set. We are going to do this in a similar vein to the Arkham Horror revised core, but with a couple slight differences. Like with Arkham, we are revamping this course set 
to make it support one to four players right out of the box. Uh, we want to lower the barrier for entry and get as many people to try this game as possible. After all, it's been going strong for 10 years for a reason. We also decided that we wanted to add the campaign mode to the revised core set, something that was originally made popular by the game's Saga expansions. This means that the revised core is going to have the same scenarios as the original, but will have some brand new boons and burdens that have not been seen in the game before, and allow players to advance from one scenario to the next. That said, if you own the original Lord of the Rings core set, you won't need to buy the revised core to experience this new campaign content, where we plan to make all of those boons and burden cards freely available as print and play content on our website. So as long as you have a core set, whether the original or this new revised version, you're going to be able to play the scenarios as a campaign. And so we're aiming to have uh, the revised core set in your hands again in early 2022. Also, similar to Arkham, we plan to repackage several of the game's cycles in the same style as we're doing for the Dunwich Legacy. There will be uh, a campaign box and a player box for each cycle that we do this for, which means getting into the game is going to be easier than ever before. But each of these repackaged campaigns is also going to contain the new boons and burdens to, to facilitate that campaign play. Just like the revised core set, these are going to be made available as print and play on our website for existing players to also enjoy. However, please keep in mind that unlike Arkham, we're not going to be re-releasing all of the old content this way. It's a lot. And so we, we're going to have a selection of stories that we want to repackage for newer players, and those are the stories that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, and, and, and at least for now, we're not going to be creating new content for the Lord of the Rings LCG. The game is filled with these amazing stories, and we're going to focus on bringing some of the best of these back in this new format. This initiative is meant to make it easier for players who have been waiting for the opportunity to jump into Middle Earth. However, for longtime fans out there, I do want to follow up on an old promise we made. So, how many of you remember this little thing? This was a very a special, very limited edition starter set that featured uh, unique components compared to the core set, including two special scenarios that you couldn't find anywhere else, uh, the Oath and the Caves of Nib and Doom. We're not going to release this limited edition product, but we are going to make those two scenarios available in their own standalone product called the Dark of Mirkwood. Better still, Using the newly integrated campaign mode, these two scenarios can then also be played uh, as a standalone mini campaign or, or even as an extension to the Mirkwood Paths campaign that is in the core set. So we're aiming for, uh, again, a Q1 2022 release for that special scenario pack. All right. Jumping from our oldest LCG to now our youngest one, let's talk about Marvel Champions. We announced the Valkyrie Hero Pack a couple weeks ago, and now it's time to unveil the final Hero Pack of the Mad Titan Shadow Wave of content. So here he is. Uh, the last hero of the Mad Titan Shadow Wave is Vision, the ultimate android. He'll be joining the ranks of his fellow Avengers in the first quarter of 2022. So rounding out that fourth wave of hero packs, Vision comes uh, with a pre-built protection deck to, uh, to play from uh, the moment, of course, that you open his pack. Uh, his gameplay revolves around his density manipulation, which makes him a strategic hero with some impressive durability. Uh, you can look forward to some card spoilers when the official announcement article hits our website in a couple weeks. And unfortunately, that's all I've got for Marvel Champions. I got nothing else. Nothing else. What is this ridiculous thing we're trying to do? <laughs> oh, oh, we have this! What is this? This is Sinister Motives, the next campaign expansion for Marvel Champions. Uh, as you can see from the artwork, this marks the beginning of a small Spider-Verse themed wave of content for the game. 
Uh, in just this box alone, you're going to gain access to the web-swinging heroes Ghost Spider and Spider-Man, uh, Miles Morales, uh, and face off against several uh, iconic Spider-Man uh, villains such as Sandman, uh, Venom, uh, the notorious Sinister Six. So as much as I'd love to, we're not quite ready to take a deep dive into this box today. Uh, but keep an eye on our website for the official announcement article in the coming months uh, for a more in-depth look at Sinister Motives. Uh, and as for the packs, the hero packs in this wave, you can probably expect some additional web warriors to join the fray, including a few really fun and unique uh, additions to the Marvel Champions hero roster, so stay tuned. All right, so let's shift gears once again, back to board games, but uh, not just any board game. Let's let's take a look at some really neat stuff coming for FFG's very first uh, board game, Twilight Imperium. So as you can see here, we are fast approaching Twilight Imperium's 25th anniversary in 2022. This is an amazing achievement for the IP that, frankly, kicked uh, Fantasy Flight off on its on its long journey. To celebrate this achievement, I'm pleased to announce a, a new line of graphic novels set in the Twilight Imperium universe developed by our friends at CMON. These graphic novels are going to expand the universe of TI in exciting and unexpected ways, and they're written and drawn by some of the biggest names in comics, including Ron Mars, Andy, Andy Lanning, uh, Dan Abnett, uh, and more. And we worked really closely with the folks at CMON to ensure that everything in these stories is going to perfectly fit within the Twilight Imperium canon. And, and while I'm at it, Twilight Imperium isn't the only IP with graphic novels in the works. Our friends at CMON are also working on a series that takes place in the Android universe. This, uh, this work is also being done by an all-star cast with Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing doing the, the writing and, uh, and, and Guillaume Balbi doing the art. Uh, there's going to be tons of surprises in store for fans of both franchises when the Kickstarter campaign for those graphic novels launches next year. So keep an eye out on social media for sneak peeks and details as they, as they come in. And while we're on the subject of FFG's classic IPs, I'll just quickly, uh, I wanted to, I'm very pleased to announce that we are also particip are partnering with uh, Event Merchandising to launch our very own Fantasy Flight Games official fan sites. Uh, these online stores are going to feature all sorts of amazing, uh, awesome swag themed around our various IPs, including pillows, mugs, shirts, art prints, and more. The stores are going to keep growing after launch, which means you can all look forward to finally getting some, some of these awesome, amazing, exciting goodies that uh, are being added uh, as time goes on. The first IP to launch uh, its fan site is uh, Legend of the Five Rings, followed closely by Arkham Horror. And then sometime after that, we're going to also see the uh, Twilight Imperium joining their ranks. Uh, the launch dates are going to vary by region, which means I, I can't exactly say when they're going to be open just yet, so stay tuned. And then uh, now I'd like to switch gears one last time. Uh, I'd like to bring in Nate French, uh, FFG's executive game designer, uh, to take a moment to get a glimpse inside the studio and share some insight on a new initiative that I started over the past several years, a, a deeper level of R&D that is already resulting in some great new upcoming games that really push the boundaries of one of FFG's core tenets, uh, innovation. So, all right, Nate, uh, I'll go ahead and turn things over to you. Uh, what would you like to share with us regarding FFG's new research and development program? Hi, everyone. So as Chris said, I'm here to share a little behind the scenes peek into the studio, and I'm going to be talking about R&D and a shift of how we're approaching it here over the, the past couple of years. So for those who might not know, what is R&D? Uh, for this discussion, I'm going to be using a pretty simple definition that says R&D is the activities that focus on the innovation of new products and services. So in other words, it's how you come up with new ideas. 
Now, there's the question, where do you get your ideas? And this is kind of laughed at as a cliche question that gets asked when the writer meets their readers or fans. And kind of on the personal artistic level, it is kind of a meaningless question because everybody's going to come up with their ideas in their own way, and sometimes they may not even know. At an organizational level, however, this is a valuable question to confront, and much of what I'm going to be sharing tonight can serve as an answer to that question from the organizational perspective. So thinking about this topic and reflecting back on my career as a designer at FFG, which I've been here since 2006, I asked myself, where have most of our new game ideas come from? So the bulk of them seem to come, as I thought back, from three main categories. The first is from the top down. Someone in an executive position, such as perhaps Christian T. Peterson or Andrew Navarro, um, would come up with the core kernel of a really cool idea that they'd then hand off to a development team to execute that idea. Uh, the second big category was partnerships with external designers. Uh, people like Eric Lang or Richard Garfield or Richard Launius would bring games to Fantasy Flight and the development teams there were to kind of support and help carry these ideas to the finish line as finished products. And then the third broad category was either expansions to pre-existing games or new editions of older games um, where the content was a little different or new for the game, but much of the blueprint of what's at the core of the game was already more or less in place. So those were the three main categories. Now there was one rare exception. Um, occasionally we get an original pitch from an FFG designer that would be accepted for publication. Uh, and like I said, this always seemed like kind of a rare exception to the case. Uh, one example that's kind of near and dear to my heart is the solo CCG pitch that turned into Lord of the Rings and had a couple follow-up ideas that Chris was talking about earlier tonight. So when I moved into my, my new role at Fantasy Flight two years ago, I kind of had this, this dream of, is there a way that we could provide our designers with more promising avenues by which they'd be able to pitch and explore their own ideas? Now this wasn't, this wasn't done with the goal of replacing those other three categories I mentioned. Um, if a good idea emerges from one of those sources, we'll certainly explore it. Instead, I think the goal here is to create an environment where the ideas being generated by FFG designers and our staff are just more regularly being thought up, conceived, pitched, and explored, so that that source is no longer the rare exception, but just a, no a more regular and standard part of our process. So why is this a desirable outcome? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons. The first is that the more talented people we engage with to kind of conceptualize and come up with ideas, the richer the pool of potential product candidates becomes. So when we sit down to make a release schedule, we'll have more ideas to choose from and the ideas will also be more unexpected and, and more varied than if they are always coming from the same group of people. Uh, and then secondly, just from the perspective of the designers and the products that they're working on, when working on an idea that you had some hand in conceptualizing, it's a lot easier to kind of get the day-to-day -day passion and satisfaction and bring that to the table, and ultimately that will result in better products and better games and happier designers. So over the past couple of years, I've been working with head of studio Chris Gerber to put some of these processes into place. And we've, so far, and this isn't, every way we're, we're always exploring new ways, but so far we have three, three, three different initiatives that we've been building and working with in this, in this capacity. The first we call design sprints. Um, this is a case where I would work one-on-one -on -one with a single designer who has pitched a candidate idea that they're excited about and they want to explore. So the goal of the design sprint is fast prototyping. We want to get a prototype of the game on the table, play it, talk about it as quickly as possible, just to see if there's anything there that we want to go further with. Um, kind of a, an, an extra benefit of these design sprints is that after designer comes off of a long project, they're a great change of pace to give that designer a kind of a breath of fresh air and to do something a little bit different before they move on to their next big project. 
Uh, the second category uh, of R&D that we've been looking at is focused R&D sessions. So this is where they're, they're longer sessions. We give one or a team of designers an extended period of time to really focus on and do a deep dive exploration of a new idea that they are interested in exploring. Um, I'll share an example of one of these sessions in a couple moments. And then the third one, which we just a couple months ago launched and ran our first our first iteration of we call it an R and D group, and this is kind of a it's about bringing together a cross disciplinary team from multiple departments in the studio, not just designers, but people from graphics and maybe an art director, someone from the marketing team, someone from the tech tech team. Like we bring people with different backgrounds together. The, the whole goal then, and they meet regularly a couple times a week, and the goal is group brainstorm and creative co collaboration and just see what comes out of that, focused on a topic, and see what comes out when those people with very diverse backgrounds just come together and start riffing on an idea. So there's a few key tenets that all of these R&D initiatives share here. Um, the first one is that the exploration is being driven by our staff. Um, it's not my role to come up with ideas and give them to these teams to explore. My contribution is mostly to provide feedback, to ask questions, and then to help these teams make things happen when we, when we put them in place and start moving them forward. Uh, secondly, the, any of these sessions are not going to be directly tied to a product release. Uh, the point of these is exploration and experimentation. Um, thinking back to working as a designer, when you start in on a game that is already on the release schedule and there's a deadline right from day one and you're, you're moving toward that deadline and you're trying to make decisions about where to take the game and how different systems and mechanics are going to work, you're going to be much more inclined and kind of pulled toward the realm of things that you have a lot of confidence on of this is very likely to work and kind of the riskier, more ambitious, experimental things that you might be intrigued to do if you had more time, you're going to shy away from and it's, it. You have to kind of keep pushing yourself back into that realm of take risks, push boundaries. So in the very early stages of exploring ideas, the freedom for an idea to not work will open up a lot of possibilities and when you when you're able to put creative people into an environment where they can take risks you're going to reap the benefits of much higher rewards so i mentioned before that i was going to give an example of um, one of the focused r d sessions so before i do um, i just want to ask everybody to keep in mind this is still an idea that is in r d we're exploring the possibilities here so i'm not promising that a game will come out of it it's an example of one of the things that our current R&D is looking at. So with that caveat in mind, though, consider the question, what does an FFG legacy game look like? This was a question that one of our senior game designers, Kara Santel Dunk, wanted to explore. Uh, Kara is one of our top designers of narrative-driven board games. Uh, in the recent past, she's worked on Mansions of Madness, Journeys in Middle-Earth, and Descent Legends of the Dark. So most of this past summer, she's been engaged with and exploring the question of what we might do with the legacy game space. Um, and the ultimate goal is to kind of take her findings and focus them down into a new game. So as we were going through the session, Kara looked at, spent a lot of time looking at core loop mechanics. What might a good core loop for a legacy game look like? Uh, she explored different narrative possibilities and ways to tell stories and what kind of stories we could tell that would take real strong advantage of the legacy game space did a huge brainstorm working with a lot of different departments of original legacy moments that could make this game stand out and shine in the legacy game area. And then finally, she worked with the production teams to see what kind of manufacturing possibilities are out there that we, in our place in the gaming industry, would be able to take advantage of and lean on to really make this game shine from a manufacturing perspective. Based on the early returns of the session, there's some really cool things that we can do in this space, and I think if things continue to go well, there's a really good chance you might see some of the results of this exploration a little bit more down the road. So that's all I have for today. Um, thanks for watching, and I'm going to turn things back over to Chris, who has one more thing he'd like to share with everybody. All right, thanks, Nate. 
uh, everybody can uh, expect some really big and exciting new announcements from FFG in the coming months and years uh, from our increased focus on R&D. All right, uh, that brings us to the end of this year's presentation, but before we go, uh, I just have one thing, one more thing to show you, but before I do that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today uh, for our 2021 in-flight report. As always, we greatly appreciate all of your love and support as we continue to make some of uh, the best games, in, in my opinion, in the tabletop industry. Uh, okay, last announcement. You know what? I'm not even going to say anything about this one. Instead, I'll just let the trailer do the talking.